Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. I'm a professional fashion critic, and this is my coverage of Paris Fashion Week in June of 2022. There is so much here, and I've purposefully mixed in the best parts throughout the video, so if you really want to get put on to some incredible stuff, you have to watch the whole video. These brands are incredible. Watch the whole... All right, so I'm really excited about this one. We're going to go see Yan Yan Vanessa, who I did an interview with not too long ago. Yan Yan is a brilliant pattern cutter. He has really imaginative shapes. Getting to see Yan Yan's work always feels very intimate. This is my second time seeing him after our interview last year in his studio. After the musical performance, we stepped inside the bamboo clothes rack of his new collection to talk okay. about it. Yan Yan Vanessa, this is the new collection. Really unusual presentation. Can you just tell me about what, what brought about the uh, the performance element of this? Um, Indre Jurgilevic is a, a good friend of us. She plays in solo, but also in a band. We don't do a show, I mean, at least for now. Tell me about the new collection a little bit. It's, it's new shapes, but it's in the same DNA and the same pattern language that I developed, so it's also always a very gradual, natural evolution. Are there any uh, materials, any any shapes, any shoulders, anything that you really feel like kind of got crystallized this season? This time it was first about fabrics more, then uh, like I wanted something light and, and kind of free and, and joyful with the see-through fabrics were very important for me for this for this lightness and then the shapes that I felt most were like these bomber kind of almost sportwear kind of shapes that I played with this time. Um, you wear all mostly your own stuff I don't think I've ever seen you in other clothes is it most of what you wear? Yeah 99% is what I make myself yeah I, I kind of I want to wear this collection now to know what I have to do next collection because I mean the wearer is the most important not not the spectator. One of my biggest inspirations for a long time is Annie Albers and this piece for instance it's I saw it in Paris last year there was an exhibition and I cried literally I was just standing in front of it for an hour. I wanted to do some more graphic work this season so I thought like what kind of graphics inspire me and this knitwear is based on this work and then I kind of Started with make, yeah, copying it, scanning it, making a repeat out of it. Kind of a bit chaotic, but it still gives like the the very calm feeling that I like. I really appreciate it. This is beautiful. Okay, so big tone shift. We're now going to Kid Super, which is going to be uh, pretty radically different than Yan Yan Vanessa. This is Colm Delane's first show physically in Paris. He had um, he was on the Paris calendar prior to that, but it was all just individual short films that he was doing because they were COVID collections. And actually, he was a, he was rejected from Paris Fashion Week one year and he printed the rejection letter onto a dress. So this being the first physical show that he's done is like a, a very nice full circle moment. Colm Delane's new collection was the best he's done so far. We're not going to get too deep on this one because we'll have an entire episode to really do this collection justice, but for now, a few details. Colm designs the clothes at Kids Super, but he also paints a ton. And the paintings have occupied the aesthetic center of his design work for years. This collection saw his paintings being auctioned off by a real-life auctioneer. The audience had 60 seconds to bid on each painting. There, there was actual bidding going on. It was crazy. And while they bid, a runway ensemble inspired by the painting would walk the room. Column's strongest work is his graphic or image-based pieces, and this collection was mostly graphics to keep with the theme. Like I said, we will go much deeper on this with the interview with Keenan Thompson of SNL, the dynamite auctioneer, and uh, some other really good stuff too. Two, three. Can I just lay down next to you? All right. So this went extremely well. I'm gonna let you finish. No rush. <laughs> this went extremely well. Thank you. <laughs> Are you slightly tired? I don't think I've slept for like literally three weeks. Eric fell asleep on the window. Lucy fell asleep on the sewing machine. I snuck off and fell asleep on the stairs where no one saw me. And it just gets getting worse and worse. Or better and better. Was there any fear to that? That it's like this, we might go through this entire process and like maybe just no one bids to begin with? The issue is the models were walking for a minute. Mm -hmm. And a minute's a long time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if they go like 2,000 and one person raises their hand and we just sit at 2,000, 
for 25 minutes. Scary times. I have never seen a runway show balance with performance art this effectively in person before. And like I said, this collection was his best so far. Oh my God, it's the restaurant. We're late, we're coming, we're coming. All right, bye. Craig Green was up next, and as you can imagine, I was shaking with excitement for this one. We made our way into the Museum of the Human and took our seats under the Balcony of Sciences. A typical Craig touch, the runway seemed to be made of a brilliant white Tyvek. Craig's whole aesthetic kind of hinges on viewing practical, engineered objects through a spiritual lens, or, or at least a ritualistic lens. Does that make sense? I often kind of have to get abstract with Craig's work. What I mean is that his accessories and the finishing details feel like they harken back to a fearful time in human history when we would wear wild outfits and perform rituals to appease the gods. But Craig contrasts these old world details with the textures and industrial details of modern life, like the eyelet detail that he's so famous for. I feel like this term gets overused a lot, but it really applies here. Craig Green makes clothes for the modern shaman. And I think this resonates so strongly with us because modern life is so devoid of meaningful rituals. Here, according to the show notes, we see young men recreating themselves in order to grow up. Craig makes the analogy of pouring yourself into the mold of adulthood, illustrated here with a literal mold of a canteen among a few other different types of mold. We also see the boys touting ominous signs of growing up, like a device that covers a stoma, which is the hole in your neck after a laryngectomy, neckties that are literally bolted into place, jacket details that honestly remind me of the medical devices like a, a vascular port or an insulin valve system, as well as a variety of hats that come equipped with blinders. But for all this anxiety around growing up or getting older in this collection, there's a sense of hope with Craig. These human kite pieces remind me a lot of the Gaelic blessing about the wind always being at your back. But here, the kite wouldn't inflate if the wind wasn't blowing against you. You have to be struggling, walking into the wind for that outfit to be what it's really supposed to be. I don't want to put too fine of a point on it, but designers with huge imaginations do often carry a lot of hope with them. The road isn't rising up to meet these boys, they're rising up and meeting the road where it is. Okay, we're heading back to my other favorite building in Paris, 3537. This is gonna be the future Dover Street Market. We're here to see some new brands, one in particular, which I'm very excited to show you. This is someone that I've actually talked to for a couple of years at this point. He does a really great job. The brand has a really cool story. I'm excited to show you. My name is Taufik Iskanda, the creative director for Use in Balaclava. Could you just tell us the story of like how you came to be known by Dover Street? All right, so basically I was assisting a photographer. Um, he was around to document the, the uh, construction of Dover Street Market Singapore. And uh, I think when we were guiding him uh, around Singapore, he took a photo of us. And when that photo came out and Adrian saw it... I think a this is Adrian Joff, Ray Kawakubo's husband. <laughs> uh, he wanted to see us, he wanted to meet us. So we did eventually, and um, he talked about working together and stuff like that. Rest is history, I suppose. So tell me about the collection that we have right now. It's like a homage to our roots and culture in that sense. So basically, it's about the Nusantara region. So Nusantara region is uh, described as the archipelago in Southeast Asia. And because of the characteristics of the archipelago, um, back then, maritime was the option for trading. So that makes a lot of the inhabitants there excellent seafarers. Of course, the European took interest and tried to colonize the whole region. They write stories about how we were savages or like we were pirates. This particular t-shirt especially is the quote that I feel like represents the whole collection. It says, because I do it for petty ship, I'm called a robber, while you who does it with a great fleet are style emperor. This is uh, one of the t-shirts that we have as well. Because coins were very important in the maritime, or rather in trading, you know. So we, we made our own coin. Oh, wait, you, you minted your own coin for this? And of course, we use this um, trimming, and I think the Chinese junk, which is a Chinese ship essentially, they will have like this calligraphy pattern. And it, it means ship, uh, a leather jacket that was inspired from a military um, outfit. So basically what we learned is that um, usually ex-military, they would wear their old uniform 
when they join in as a privateer. We, we take the element and then we made it into a leather jacket. As we were packing up to run to the next appointment, Taufik asked me to turn the mic back on. And I was like, oh, okay, did we forget about a certain piece? And he was like, nah, bro, just turn it back on. Go for it. Okay, if you want to get more exclusive content from Bliss Foster, please subscribe to his Patreon. You won't, won't regret it. It's, he has like such a like a good and interesting community, like this whole ecosystem of like of his followers and stuff. So please subscribe to his Patreon. It's only how much? Uh, it's three dollars a month. I it's did not. only three dollars a month, dude. You can buy like. <laughs> Cigarettes afterwards, you know, like cigarette costs you twelve dollars. I didn't tell him to do this, guys. He literally just told me to turn the microphone back on. So we're gonna go to the showroom for J.W. Anderson, which is a little bit unusual because he shows in Milan, and it's not showing in Paris. But we're gonna make an exception here because Jonathan is one of the best fashion designers currently working. So we're gonna go see what the new collection looks like. I honestly don't know how Jonathan Anderson does all this. He's consistently putting out incredible product at Loewe, and the product at his eponymous brand is equally strong, but with its own voice. His own brand being much more generally playful, and Loewe leaning more towards the elevated, luxurious pothead, which is a term that Jonathan has lovingly used to describe his own work. One of the big standouts of this collection was the use of graphics. My personal favorite was this outstanding print that I later found out is literally a stock photo. That, that that wonderful snippet is from style.com. This collection made heavy use of a self-portrait of Rembrandt, but the real treasures here are in these pieces that probably only a few will be produced, like these heavyweight leather coats, these brilliantly cut leather shorts with just an outstanding texture to them. I wish you could feel these. These knitwear pieces with these awesome glove attachments and the flowing colorful shirting, which I consider to be Jonathan's strongest product category at Loewe and his home label. We're in a period of menswear that's largely dominated by playfulness and J.W. Anderson stands as one of the best representatives of that ethos. Okay, so I have kind of a, a surprise. I don't know how well this is gonna go, but we're at least gonna go to the location. Let's, uh, let's go to the first Margiela show. There are at least people in the building. We're gonna see if we can go inside. Cafe de la Guerre is still used as a universal art space. As we were walking through the courtyard, there was a flamenco dance class in session. So we were stopped at the door by two people who helped run Cafe de la Guerre who wanted to know what we were doing and I, I tried explaining to them. It's like my whole career is kind of about this artist. And so like, your boy is not very good at thinking on his feet sometimes. But they were super sweet and they offered us a compromise. And we can come then? That would be great for you. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, of cool. course. So they said the space is closed because they're setting up the staging area where Martin put the show on and that we can come back tomorrow and walk around in there a little bit so we actually get to see. I am extremely excited and I am also completely exhausted and so happy. This is Tom Brown. Tom's work is so over the top that I feel like Paris Fashion Week is such a good place for him and this is the first Tom Brown show. I, I probably shouldn't have said that the entire time. It was like, this is my first show with them because it's like, yeah, Bliss, we know. They're all your first show. Tom Brown was outstanding. A lot of houses put vibrant fantasies onto the runway, but Tom always backs those ideas up with outstanding craftsmanship. The strongest example of that is that many of these pieces were done up in a French tweed made by the same company that produces the legendary tweeds for Chanel. That specific company doesn't like to be named in the media, so I will respect that. The jock straps in this show were the big focal point, and it's easy to look at this, stay with me, it's easy to look at this and dismiss it as silliness. And just to say, there will be nothing silly about how quickly these are going to sell out, but also, Tom is introducing a pretty cool shape proposal here. The straps allow for a very low slung pant to be baggy. When McQueen introduced the Bumpster in the 90s, the pants always had to be painted on, just skin tight, or else they would fall down. But here we get the same length of pant. Tom starts on the waist in the same place, but the shorts can be a relaxed cut because they're supported by the attached jock strap. As Tom said in an interview, this isn't just shock value. The show started with a few empty seats scattered around the room, which is very unusual. The show began with a small group of classic brown suits. Then suddenly a handful of women burst into the room apologizing for being late, all of them wearing full Tom Brown, of course. 
This fun skit was a cool way of demonstrating the variety of the Tom Brown family. Among these women were a painter, a documentarian, and an actress who also happens to be the granddaughter of Elsa Scaparelli. But even beyond the models, Tom invited and dressed two former Olympic fencing medalists. Tom Brown doesn't ascribe to the get the biggest star possible philosophy like with many luxury brands. The guests and the models are purposefully chosen. They are truly a part of the brand's world building and storytelling. Yeah. We're very excited. Walking up to Steven Pissarro, my hair is still wet, so that's very professional. Uh, Steven is a new designer on the calendar, pretty young designer, a lot of really good shapes. The 10 a.m. slot is a really interesting one because you get to see a lot of people doing a lot of experimentation, and hopefully that is what we will see here. Cool, yeah, you, you kind of tackled one of the hardest problems in fashion, which is like transferring an emotion into clothes. Can you tell me a little bit about what the, the process was of trying to figure out how to express things like um, sadness or anger in clothes? Actually, we did by a kind of a workshop with one of my actually coaching therapists uh, as a group uh, on how people express their anger uh, and how what the color, the moods, when you feel your clothes, as well as the texture of the fabrics. Uh, fear, sadness, and anger is something you, that, that might happen to you. You don't want to feel, but it, uh, it just happens and you have to feel them. Was this all specifically choreographed or was there like a little bit of free form to it? A bit of free form to it because it, it was this space of like, how do you feel today? And I told them, guys, embody your emotion, but if you feel today you feel weird, awkward, go for it. It's about expressing yourself at the end of the day. This, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Okay, so apparently the Palette of Tokyo has an original Banksy, which I'm only assuming it's an original Banksy because it says this is not a Banksy above it. I'm guessing. I don't know. I guess it would be pretty easy to recreate this, but I have no idea. Banksy, look. Okay, so pretty unexpectedly got sort of a late invitation to this one. We're going to Doublet. Relatively new brand, really, really funny stuff. Like these are clothes that have actually made me laugh out loud a few times, which is a, uh, it's always a good sign. Okay, 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 okay. So Doublet does a lot of hilarious things in every show, and I'm not really one for lists, but this seems appropriate here. Here is a list of all of the funny things in Doublet Spring 2023. A parody of Martin Margiela's mannequin jackets. A parody of Vibram Five Fingers. A suit that is also a onesie. A matching crochet set that looks like it's blurring out nudity. <laughs> Hilarious tan lines. A hip chain that's made out of fingers. Baked goods as abs. Furry slippers with trompe l'oeil laces. Untorn jeans that actually look torn up because the tears and the skin underneath the tears is sewn into the fabric of the jeans. That's, that's not even so much a funny thing, it's just insanely cool. A reflective leather bucket, like look at it, it's, it's not a bucket, that, that is actually leather. And again, that's more on the awesome side of things. The front and back of suspenders with the front and back of pants. Trump loy of a transparent trench coat printed onto a regular trench coat. Jeez, that's, that's like super sick looking. Hair hat, unclear if it comes with wig attachment. Popcorn gloves. A hoodie hoodie and sweatpants sweatpants. <laughs> Incredible! When we first entered this space, there were models that were already in place silently acting out a barbecue at a public park. Once the show started, despite the sweltering heat and humidity, they set up a fake snowstorm using very small pieces of white biodegradable confetti. As the show progressed, the snow became heavier and heavier until we kind of couldn't see. It was hilarious. It was so wonderful. I spoke with Masayuki Aino, the founder and creative director, through his translator, and he said that he was inspired by a visit to Singapore where it's always hot. But around Christmas time, they do the same idea for their kids so that the kids get to experience snow even though they're wearing tank tops and sandals. I know is totally focused on just having fun with his work and it's really effective. Doublet is the most purely fun brand currently working. Next up was Marine Sayre. One crazy thing about this show, believe it or not, was a matter of logistics. Last season in Paris, there was a massive crowd in front of Marine's show. It was insanely packed. This, of course, was no one's fault. People get excited. No one understands that more than me. But this season, instead of just raising security, Marine Serre embraced that challenge and made their venue accommodate the massive crowd. Almost a thousand non-industry people came out to the show. I didn't see one person get turned away. That That is unbelievably rare in fashion. For how huge and devoted the Marine Serre fan base is, it was really cool to see them do a truly populous show where everyone who wanted to come could come. 
Okay, so I have to talk really close to the microphone because the after party is going on right now and I uh, don't want to get copyright struck. Marina set up a really challenging place for herself to work in. All the clothes have to remain very, very tight to the body, but she still has to find innovative shapes. And there were a few items that were like that. The apron was one good example of that. The tights that sort of turned into a literal thong, which is a pretty funny detail. She's also managed to be one of the only new logos that has really stuck. Obviously, every brand wants to have a big culturally impactful logo that everybody wants and Marine Sarah is one of the only ones that's been able to introduce a new logo into the luxury market that has stuck in a very real way. So she has to use that logo and she has to use the logo repeat print a lot and she's found some interesting ways in this show and, and all the shows over the last six years to kind of find little flips on that logo that keep it looking fresh but still keep it at the core of the brand. Okay so this is take two on attempting to go into Cafe de la Guerre. This is pretty unplanned uh, but they said that we could come in today so we're just gonna see if that's actually possible i'm like excited just like being close to it like my fashion senses are going crazy yeah this is it so this is the original space uh the models like walked around through this area right here which is super crazy everybody like kind of going up the stairs turning coming back down going back over the cool thing about this space is that it gets used for so many things then and it's still used for a ton of different stuff now obviously there is a play going on right now which is extremely cool this is where everybody came out at the end it's one of the few like actual bows that martin ever actually did in person where he was showing his face and before everything got like too complicated for him um, but yeah this space is like a legendary part of the parisian art scene and it has a very special connotation for me personally. So that was absolutely insane. And it's okay, so we can tell here that I was pretty excited slash nervous. There isn't much to say about this space that I haven't already gone into a ton of detail already in the main Margiela series, but this was an incredibly special experience for me personally. Okay, so I am thrilled to say that I am going to an undercover showroom for the first time. I have been obsessed with this brand in a way that is difficult for me to describe, which is rare. I've been obsessed with this brand for about five years, and I, uh, I cannot wait to see this new collection. June is a genius. Let's go. This season, it was just the showroom for undercover, and it was so strange because having been obsessed with undercover for years, I've always seen June's work in individual pieces, but never as a complete set before. It was a really different perspective. Undercover always works from a fanboy perspective. In the past, he's covered A Clockwork Orange, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Star Wars, etc. This season's fixation was the band Pink Floyd. And Undercover kind of sets the standard for the modern punk aesthetic. They almost never bill themselves as punk, but I often see these collections as the baseline from which every other punk-adjacent designer operates. We see that in all the little variants on jeans and jackets in this collection. But the real highlight here was some of the women's offerings. We had some excellent details that play into the strongest side of June's work, and that's a combination of sweet nostalgia with these hardened runaway from home type details that are added okay. throughout. I'm really excited. This is a brand that um, just literally some random person put me onto. They were like, oh, you should look at these guys. And I did, and they're incredible. And then literally by coincidence, I found out that they had a showroom in Paris during Fashion Week. I'm very excited about this one. This is where the magic happens. Hi, I'm Matthew South from Ego. It's kind of just me and my friend Aziz, who's our creative director. The first body of work is based on a amalgamation of like sci-fi and video game references and a lot of leathers, so it's a lot of mixed media work. Most of it is synthetic, most of it's waterproof, so we value like technical specifications and functionality, and then the design kind of comes after those requirements have been met. These are like cargo pants. Yeah, that's like a stretch canvas. But then it's super structured with this to allow the silhouette to drape on your body like that. It like stays out, you know what I mean? What are the video game things? I know we, we could probably talk about this for like two hours. Um, but Metal Gear Solid being the, the premium one for this, at least the first collection. Okay, so the real test for both of y'all, did you like Death Stranding? I have not played it yet, to be honest. Oh All right, see you guys later. Bye. The first item we ever made, wanted to make some like leather pants that he could actually move around it and wear every day. And Are these such actually real leather? Yeah. yeah. They're Heavy. incredibly thick. What? Yeah. It's armor. Real life armor. Yeah, no shit. Well, okay, wait, so, like, that's how thick they are. It's like a quarter inch thick leather. And each pair is about, like, three or four pounds. 
but the way that it's built, it like dissipates off you. It's more for the stack and the, the general effect. It's full range of motion. We had to develop a knit fabric that was breathable, but that could also be sewn to leather without breaking. And then we just like a lot of different types of leather. Like this is a raw leather from Argentina. This is what a cow looks like untreated. It looks like paint splatter and stuff like that. Super, super detailed. It's just a natural part of the tanning process though. Like that's just what happens. No, this is untanned. This is oh my God. just dried leather from the cow. This is um, another like really premium leather that we got. This is Italian Verona. This is like some elasticated sleeve that I like ripped from basically ripped from Issey Miyake. I don't really care about saying that either. Like he's like a super big inspiration for me. And then we just have basics, which aren't that interesting. But this is like a really cool, um, women's that's piece. That's, that's yeah, sick, dude. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, it's weighted. Yeah. It should be so, um, this is a knit. It's skin tight, but we found that if it's skin tight, the, the leather kind of creases in weird ways. So we put curtain weights in it to always have it drape properly. And if they get mad enough at someone, they can just sort of like, wapa, yeah. <laughs> and then like we had a, a, a macrame is... artist make this, Noelle Morikow. She's like out of Chicago as well. She does like mixed media with rope. All the pants have like a, like lots of like Fidlock hardware on them that we're going to like keep incorporating different kind of like accessories that can go back and forth. So maybe you buy this pair of pants this year and then three years from now, we release like a new like accessory. You can keep on wearing it. You can keep on like upgrading it, if mm. you will. The Gundam kit. Well, that was incredible. I love showrooms like that. That is what gets me super excited about Fashion Week is being able to figure out about new brands that I had no knowledge of prior to this and that I am really excited to learn more about. We're now walking up to Fen Chen Wang. I've been a fan of theirs for a few years. I'm really excited to actually see these clothes in person for the first time. And it's at the beautiful Palette of Tokyo, which is my favorite. I'm uh, Fen Chen Wang, and I have my own neighbor called Fen Chen Wang, the same, but you can call me Fen. How many seasons have you been designing and showing? Six and a half years so far. And this is my first time showing in Paris. Where were you showing previous to that? So we've been showing New York Fashion Week, London Fashion Week, plus Shanghai Fashion Week before. So many. So you've like got all the experience. Tell me about the collection a little bit. Yeah, and the collection is inspired by, you know, uh, people who are imaging. These people is quite conflict and contradiction. So it's always like uh, maybe she feel happy, but also feel sad. And this is how it shows like, uh, you know, material, you got like something see-through, something not and all combined together. Yeah. So it's and all these elements that kind of show all of the different sides of people yeah. and how they work together in people Ooh. and in the clothes as well. Yeah, I love that. that. Yeah, <laughs> I see it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Tell me about the color choices. How, how do you come to decide specific shades of different colors? And this season, you can see the color is a little bit more, not that noisy. And then also on a black white, but with a transparency material. So it doesn't really like a full black or full white because it's always like showing your skin color, you know, showing who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, that the more muted colors can kind of show your skin tone a little bit more yeah. and not like act like it's like changing you a little bit. Yeah, yeah true. that's very true. cool. This is wonderful. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And honestly, this building is gorgeous. Here, it's just my second fashion week, but I've probably been to this building 12 or 13 times, and every time I've been in a different room. Unlocking new areas in the Palais de Tokyo has been one of my favorite little things about working in Paris. I ran into one of the leaders of fashion, Tebe Magugu. We were both there to see the show by another godfather of South African fashion design. Um, my name is David Klale. I'm a fashion designer based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Tell me a little bit about the collection overall. I think the departure point was let the good times roll. The silhouettes and the fabrics for the collections purely say let clothing be fluid. Men and women can wear it. Over the years, I've always loved a pussy bow blouse, and I've always only put it on women. And this time, I was like, let's put it on men and see what's going to happen. The reception has been like really amazing. People are like, I could wear that. And these are like macho men. I was like, then we are doing something right. There was one shirt in particular, and I love the textile on it as well, but it was like the prep thing of like the sleeves are tied over the chest. Yes. Is the, are the sleeves part of the top, or was that a separate top tied on top? So the sleeve is actually part of the yoke. And that's almost kind of like a good intro place for a pussy bow for guys. Yes. Because that's that's really what they are. Like, especially with the sweaters, it's yeah. like this big knot. Knot. Yeah. Absolutely. How do you go about 
selecting the specific kind of color? I don't select the color, the color selects me, and then I work with it. First color was like a, a tangerine, um, and then I was like, I'm not feeling it, and then they gave me an aqua, I was like, no, just like, give me an orange, and they gave me like four pairs of orange, and the very strong one, which is like a natural orange, and giving us different hues, was the one that really caught my eye. It also represents a few elements, the sunset, and you see the umbre of it, it's like really, really beautiful, and that's why we incorporated it in, into the collection. This was an incredible collection. I loved it. Oh, thank you so yeah, much. Thank absolutely. You. Thanks yeah, for your time. I appreciate it. My name is Antonio Zaragoza. Uh, my, uh, the name of the, my brand is Liberal Youth Ministry. I am from Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, the name of the collection is Ciudad del Sol, which translates to something like the city of the sun. It started with the idea of what will happen if we weren't being conquered by Spanish. And I was thinking about the youth of Mexico, if they had with their roots with the Aztecs and the Mexica Empire. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was that they would still uh, pay homage and tribute to the gods. And then I was like, uh, this youth, uh, I think they will dance perreo, which is like, you know what perreo means? Mm -hmm. It's like Latin American, uh, really sexual dance that is almost like grinding. I think it's something really punk because people in Mexico or in Latin American countries, usually like older people get scared because of these dances. That's why I, I came with this slogan for the collection that says Perreo Multidimensional, which translates to multidimensional perreo. Do you remember Dragon Ball Z, uh, Dragon Ball Z? Yeah. Do you remember where the, when they were trying to like beat the bad guy and they went into a chamber where they train. Hyperbolic time chamber, yes, of course. Yeah. So a lot of, of, of the garments are like really heavy. You can weigh this. That weighs like 22 pounds. That is a, that is a very heavy garment. Uh, it's a multi-layer hoodie with uh, one, two, three, four, like six. It's all just fabric? Yeah. This feels like there's weights in it. That is so heavy. These are the heaviest clothes I've ever held. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah, it's just fabric. That's fucking wild. Like a dog could bite you with this on and you'd be yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's this idea of when they like uh, transcend into something deeper, they, they, the gravity changes. So that's why it's like really basic garments, but they weigh so much. So it's this idea of protection, this idea to be ready to like fight against like something yeah. evil, maybe. Uh, to go defeat Frieza. This is incredible. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, gonna go see Ernest W. Baker. I've been a fan of their work for a while and I have never gotten to see it in person, which is crazy, like even at stores. So I'm really excited to finally go in here. This is a showroom appointment, so it's gonna be a lot more intimate. I'm excited, let's go. I'm Reed Baker. And I'm Minish. And, and where, where is Ernest? I, I know the answer, but I want to hear it. Uh, so it's my grandfather. So it's kind of, yeah, the idea of the brand when we started was to use this familiar element. So using my grandfather, but kind of to represent both of our heritage, our culture, our families, and kind of, yeah, so it's my grandfather. So I would love to hear just some words about the collection overall. Our approach to it this season was similar to what we did in the beginning of the pandemic, Spring Summer 20 collection, is kind of shelter ourselves in the collection in this sense of innocence. This season, we kind of looked at classic tailoring through the lens of a child so we kind of propose these different looks with like classic tuxedo blazers with short shorts sandals with socks very iconic children's pieces like overalls mary jane sneakers so really like pushing this idea of this innocence this naivety that comes along with being and dressing as a I child mean, big concepts like naivety or like innocence what's the process of of landing in that place where it's like this is an object to me that feels like innocence. It comes a lot from research and picking up on these elements that like that is very referential you know that's our process in general is you know simple but it's these pieces that are very referential like okay child, children do this I mean simple socks with sandals that is sort of bad taste but it's sort of an ignorant bad taste as a child so yeah you know even the overalls as well every piece we like to then add our touch to it this is a flair. Tell me about textiles a little bit. The brand origins is a bit this like grandpa chic and we've been exploring this a bit grandma chic. So using these boucles, you know, playing a bit with the proportions of pieces as well. We are based in Portugal, so we use a lot of the, we produce everything locally around us. You know, that's the big reason why we're based there is that we're able to control our manufacturing, make sure everything's done exactly how we want it, tapping into the craft of what's going on around there. So another concept that we play with a lot of our spring-summer collections um, is this concept of rain and kind of the chaoticness, but the comfort. So we developed a pinstripe, it's like a rain pinstripe. Oh, 
and it's like rain camo. Exactly. But it's, but it's in a yeah, black. That's yeah, so yeah, cool. Yeah. Also, pretty huge news for the brand. I heard that the BTS guys came through and placed a substantial order with them. So hopefully we'll be seeing some of these pieces in the coming months on V, Jungkook, Jimin, and the other BTS boys. BTS ARMY FOREVER! YES! 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 Thank you for letting me have that sweet BTS SEO boost. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to join the Patreon. A lot of the interviews that are in these Fashion Week videos will be featured in full length, but only on the Patreon. You're all incredible. I love you so much. I will see you in September for the next Paris Fashion Week. And in the meantime, we will have best-in-class fashion videos every single week. Join the motherfucking Patreon. <laughs> Biatch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>